name is Raj. Uh, I am with Lights. Oh. Once again, welcome everyone. My name is Raj. I'm with uh, Lightspeed. We are a small uh, boutique agile transformation coaching and training uh, service company based out of Washington, DC. And I'm happy to be here. And this afternoon, I'm going to share with you um, some of our experiences uh, at Lightspeed in terms of product development and how we stumbled into the whole lean startup movement. And um, talk about some of the tools specifically uh, that we've used, some of the learnings that we've had, and how we are applying some of those learnings to the larger enterprise, because we do a lot of coaching services in the, in the enterprise uh, space, but we definitely begin to see uh, some aspects of the Lean start, Startup ideas and tools that we can bring to bear in the larger enterprise. How many of you work for large enterprises? Okay, most of you, and startup type come. Is relative, yeah, but <laughs> so what, what's your definition of large? Okay, oh wow, that's mega large. But anyway, anybody in the startup space here? Yeah, okay, all right, just one. Okay. Wow. So let me just quickly start with, uh, by asking you guys a question. How many of you think some of the items listed here are risks with current Agile implementations? Uh, backlog items not validated against customer needs. Then we have this godlike product owner who knows everything about uh, the needs, the customer backlog, the acceptance criteria, and so forth. Um, you know, there's lack of clear advice on how to change direction. Agility is about responsiveness to change, but Increasingly, I notice that uh, I don't really see that manifest in a lot of implementations. Uh, and also, you know, we're all technologists at heart. We do what we do best, which is to build, 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 right? So uh, d does this sort of resonate with at least some of your experiences? It definitely has happened with me, both in the small and the large scale. Uh, it seems like what we are really doing in the name of Agile is building incrementally. And I try to draw a distinction, and hopefully I'll share that with you as we go through the slides, is there's a difference between incremental time boxed development and iterative development. You know, with, with incremental development, you already have a, a well-formed idea, and you're really using the incremental model, the time box model, to um, incrementally build out that fully uh, realized idea in the minds of our stakeholders. Uh, does this happen with a lot of you guys, or is it truly iterative, where you are refining uh, idea sprint after sprint? So one one hand up, right? So, but how about uh, for the rest of you? Is this re is the reality of your agile implementations? The idea is sort of concrete, and all we're doing is building it out in an incremental fashion. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. That's not truly being agile, it helps, but it really is not, uh, you're not realizing the full benefits of, of being agile. Uh, because fundamentally, most initial business models or these ideas that stakeholders think, I have a brilliant idea, is going to, you know, seldom do they pan out. Uh, the most famous examples, of course, is uh, PD en encryption software system led to the creation of PayPal. Right? Another famous one is there was a game, um, an online, massive online uh, multi-user game called Game Never Ending, g &E. That was the genesis that, that led to the creation of Flickr, right? g and &E lasted for like a year and a half or something in 2004, 2005. So the, the point I'm trying to make is most, most of these ideas that we think are brilliant ideas are probably brilliant in our own minds or our stakeholders' minds. A lot of it is a different idea, it's sort of morphed into Instagram. Of course, in these cases, these are fantastic, fantastic great examples where they've made a ton of money, but unfortunately, that wasn't our story. Right? So, uh, so at Lightspeed, we had this brilliant idea, oh, and this is not, it's, it's just gonna, you know what? Yeah. So let, let me just talk through this, okay? 
because uh, I know there's another session uh, following right after mine. So the idea was uh, a few years ago, we said, you know, um, we want to build uh, a, a, an electronic tool to facilitate continuous improvement items. The most ex uh, obvious example of that would be retrospectives, right? How many of you all do retrospectives? What went well, what didn't go well? So we wanted to increasingly, as we started to see a lot of distributed teams, uh, um, we begin to realize, and like with most um, agile adoptions, the ceremony that's dropped most is the retrospective. And we believe it's an important uh, of practice. And, and with, with the proliferation of distributed teams, we thought that thing was totally you know, falling by the wayside. What could we do to sort of mitigate that uh, problem? So we said, OK, if you have a brilliant idea, we're going to build this tool um, uh, for, uh, for, for facilitating near real-time retrospectives. Um, so we built a prototype in code, not a paper prototype. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, Ruby on Rails was the whiz bang thing to do. So you know, we hired some hotshot uh, Ruby on Rails developers. And we started building this prototype. And we took it on the road to all the big conferences. And everybody said, this is awesome. And by everyone, I mean just our friends. Right? Of course they're going to tell you it's awesome. The question we should have asked is, will you pay for it? Right? <laughs> Which we didn't realize. Yeah, they said, OK, we were stoked by everybody's enthusiasm. There wasn't a tool such as uh, the tools called Sensei. It's still out there. Um, and uh, they say it was awesome, so we said, okay, we'll continue doing what we know best, which is continue to add more capabilities, and we continue to do that. Uh, we lost our team because uh, Ruby on Rails developers were, were you know, in demand. Maybe they still are. Anyway, the point is we continued building, 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 you know, uh, thinking that build, and they will come someday. Paying customers, that is. Uh, <clears throat> So we spent about six months doing that, six to eight months. And then we almost, I mean, we were funding this ourselves. Not that it was a big, expensive tool, but still it was coming out of our pockets. And uh, we had a, a decent solution in place, but very few customers, right? And at this point, it was still in beta. We weren't really charging anybody. By customers, I mean people who were just using the system. Right? Um, but we didn't know where to go. Right, we were running out of our runway money, and it, the tool was there, advertised, some customers didn't know what to do. Right? So just about that time, 2011, 2012, we, it, we attended this conference, uh, the, the Lean Startup Conference, and Eric Reese was there. And that was our introduction to the whole Lean Startup movement. How many of you are familiar with the Lean Startup movement, I assume? Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, sort of uh, Eric Reese. Uh, came out with this book. It was uh, a revelation to us in terms of uh, his ideas. Again, not all of his ideas were totally original. It was based off of uh, ideas by Steve Blank. He talked about customer development. Nurturing customers is key when you think about product development and so forth. But again, this has become ubiquitous now, right? The build, measure, learn cycle. I'm not going to sort of talk a lot about that, because these days, everybody knows about the build, measure, learn cycle. But in a nutshell, what we got out of that was, so we were at this sort of crossroads, right? We built this product. We didn't know what to do with it. We don't have money. Uh, and what the lessons learned for us was really what we should have done was we should have described our business case as this uh, a set of assumptions instead of essentially thinking that this is going to be a, a sure shot. Um, talking to early adopters, we had done some of that, but not really real paying customers. And the way we were interviewing people was obviously uh, totally incorrect. So. Um, create prototypes, but maybe test assumptions very cheaply, um, pivot, which is another word you'll see a lot, um, and deliver often with high quality um, uh, software using agile methods. So what we knew really was just this part, right? Just because we were good at agile delivery doesn't make necessarily make us good product development folks. And that's what uh, was the realization that dawned upon us. So there's this whole aspect of discovery that we were completely missed when we built our product. So to me, so this picture, again, um, is a courtesy of Jeff Patton, by the way. Uh, for those of you who know Jeff Patton's story mapping and all of that work, it, it's been popularized by him. The, so the, the, the real agility is about making sure that you have ways to think of your idea as just that. It's just an idea, and then you need to continuously iterate on it validate the idea that it's actually going to be, there's going to be a return on investment um, before you start to build, 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 right? The question is, looks good on paper. How the heck do you really do that, 
right? So next I'm going to get into what we've tried and some of the tools, right? Um, again, it's our experience, and there's probably a whole lot more tools out there that'll serve your needs, but uh, let me share what we've done and how we're applying that in the larger enterprise now, okay? So what the Lean Startup Conference gave us uh, was really the idea that you may be great at delivery, but that's not the whole story. That there's an equally important part, which is discovery, right? And this isn't, this isn't relevant just in the startup space, right? This is relevant even in the enterprise space. Uh, space. And when, I, when we talk about this entire value, talks about this, right? Scrum, XP, Kanban, whatever you want. It's about delivery. Okay. Um, but the discovery aspect precedes that, and there's also an aspect that's afterwards, right? Identifying the real customer needs, the product market fit, all of those aspects, as well as once you're iterating on the solutions, how do you really validate that you're meeting, the, uh, meeting those needs? And this is where, to us, the Lean Startup movement gives us and fills out that larger picture, right? So. Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward, right? <clears throat> so what we be begin to believe in, and this illustration depicts that, is um, there, there's, there's tools, there's techniques to be good about um, discovering your customer needs, your product, uh, pr product needs, and that should be balanced with your uh, agile delivery uh, mechanisms, your Scrum, XP, what, what not, uh, and, and then also, uh, your entire product increment should be validated by some sort of data metrics. Um, and <clears throat> what I'm going to talk next is really the flow of how this happens and what kind of tools that you can bring to bear uh, as you sort of go through the discovery process, uh, you know, the, your product backlog, and so forth. So let's start with uh, holistic discovery. <clears throat> So this is, this is the part preceding before you even get to the product backlog, right? You have an idea uh, and you're trying to sort of target um, customer needs and, uh, and uh, market fit. And again, just don't think of this as true, uh, just being about startup companies and startup ideas because I'll share with you examples of how this is being done in big companies. Marriott.com is an example of a hotel chain that does this pretty well. Um, so <clears throat> I'll share some ideas there. So in terms of the discovery part, the first part of it, what we're really trying to see is identify and discover the customers, the market risk, and maybe to some degree even a technical risk, if there is some sort of a, a unknown there. And in order to do that, you really, to discover customer needs, a couple of techniques, um, interviewing users. That's easier said than done. If you guys are in the space where you want to sort of do this in very intentional customer discovery, it's not enough to just say, yeah, I'm gonna go outside and talk to, talk to somebody, right? The first aspect really is about what in the Lean Startup world they call it goobing. You heard of that? Getting out of the building, G-O-O-B, right? The first step is to get out of the building and talk to people. Um, and there's lots of um, uh, questionnaires and samples that you can take a look at. I particularly like the one that I've listed at the bottom. And by the way, I'll share um, all of these slides with you guys if there's interest. I'll post it on SlideShare. Uh, definitely worth checking out if you're thinking about being very intentional about your discovery aspects. And, uh, and if, your mo if your mode of interaction is gonna be just these uh, conversations with, with, with potential customers or even uh, people on the street, right? So, uh, observing users in their native environments. How many of you here, how many of you are developers, testers, coaches, developers? Uh, testers, coaches, and the rest of you, managers? Yeah, okay. Um, so what I wanted to say is, uh, how many of you actually go and observe, uh, I'm talking about, let's say, the, the, the agile teams, the developers, testers, BAs. Um, how many of you actually observe your your potential end users in their environment as they're working? How many? Probably nobody, right? So right now, um, I'm a coach in a large, large transformation in the US federal space, Homeland Security. You would think this kind of stuff is not gonna fly in a large enterprise, especially a federal government space. But what they're beginning to do now is they, once every month, every two, uh, every two sprints, 
teams will actually spend time with the actual field agents and see how they're working, how they're interacting with the software, and actually uh, and come back and uh, report those findings to those product owners, sometimes the product owners go there, just so that the developers and the testers have a real sense of how end users are, are, are interacting with their systems, okay? Um, <clears throat> And another technique, so interviews, uh, sitting in, 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 in the native environments, concierge, simulating the system, and I'll show you some examples. In fact, there's a great example right here outside of Bangalore that Intuit ran, and I'll share that uh, experience in a second. Uh, we'll talk about concierge, uh, concierge uh, prototyping, rapid prototypes. You guys, how many of you use like uh, balsamic and such to run a paper prototypes before you actually build things out? Anybody? No? Okay, okay. Uh, so, all different kinds of ways of discovering and seeding your product backlog, okay? A tool, because we are talking about tools here, uh, a great tool that we've used, and I recommend you check it out, it's called the Validation Board. And it's, it's a tool that lets you write down your uh, hypothesis. You know, what customer segment are you going after? What is the a problem hypothesis? What problem is your particular feature or your product solving? It could be as small as a feature, right? But you don't go out and crank out the code and build it out, but you essentially be very intentional about understanding who am I targeting, what is the problem, uh, before you get to the solutioning, and what um, are some of the, uh, the experiments, if you will, that you can run to validate before you actually get to a solution. A simple example could be Naresh is running this conference, right? Now his hypothesis, uh, his uh, problem hypothesis might be, yeah, there's not enough agile conferences to serve uh, the development community, right? That, that's a problem hy hypothesis. Uh, and the customer hypothesis would be, he says, if I do this, I think developers, testers, agilists will attend the conference. What's the riskiest assumption? that they'll actually show up, right? So again, it's a very simple board. It's a visualization technique. You can do it for product development, for whatever you want, right? So, um, and then you get out and you start interviewing the questions, observing them and so forth, and you're trying to validate the actual need, the problem, right? You're discovering uh, the problem need, uh, the customer segment that you may be targeting, is, is it the right customer segment and so forth. Very simple tool, very effective tool. And if you, if, you, if you realize that, hey, it's not the right product need, it's not the right solution, whatever the case may be, you start making adjustments. Try different experiments. Maybe it's not the Agilist. Maybe they need some other type of a customer segment, right? So, um, so that's part of the discovery process, again, right? Before you have written a single line of code still. Uh, once you have narrowed down on, um, at least that's what we did, once we came to the point where we were like, we, we don't have enough money to continue working on our product. What do we do? We started, we stopped. We started actually using the validation board before we added new features to make sure we were adding the right kind of things. Um, and another great tool, to, the guy who's going to talk next has used it, right? <clears throat> oh, is this going to come up? So the Lean Canvas tool is a great uh, way to sort of depict, it's a one pager to depict your business case and your business need. Once you've validated that a particular idea is resonating with a certain customer segment, you make your business case. Single pager, nothing fancy, nothing big, right? Um, and I'll, if only the slides would come up, I could show this with you. <clears throat> it's freely available, and again, I have the links to all of these canvases and models so you can free to download and try it out, right? So I'm just going to keep moving on because the, the Lean Canvas, again, there's a certain intentional way you go about filling it, but the idea is it's still a single page, uh, single page business, business model, not like your typical business case documents that you put out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was going to show you an example of how we created the business, uh, the Lean Canvas for our product, the, the retrospective tool, um, but maybe I'll come back to it. Now, this is a recurring problem, huh? All right, so this is the Lean Canvas. It's broken up into different segments. I'm not gonna necessarily walk through each of them. I'd encourage you to sort of go to leanstack.com, 
Um, and uh, Ash Moria wrote a great book called Running Lean. In the references uh, section of the book, I, at the end, I um, list out good reads and good templates that you can potentially use. But fabulous little tool to capture your, uh, your, your business case. <clears throat> So what we did, this is essentially an example of what we tried to do with Sensei, our retrospective tool, because we weren't really being very intentional about exactly who we are targeting, what sort of metrics are we trying to capture, none of that. But once we sort of came back from our conference, we started to be more intentional about it. We tried to look at our customer segments, who are we really targeting, distributed teams, coaches, scrum masters, uh, what kind of metrics do we need, how many people are signing up, well, that was a lousy metric. Those are called vanity metrics. We were getting excited about the fact that, oh, hundreds of people are si signed on. But the question is, are they using it? Right? That's the deeper question to answer. So metrics, and we'll talk a little bit more about metrics, it, they need to be a little more than just pure vanity metrics, saying 100 people came to our website, but what did they do with it? Right? How long did they stay in it? Did they at least finish an entire use case? Uh, those are all important. So those are. Uh, metrics <clears throat> that you come up with. Um, so once, so moving on to uh, the product backlog, you have an idea, you captured your business case, perhaps now you're going to start to sort of fill out your uh, product backlog. What sort of things could you do there and what kind of tools could you sort of bring to bear there? Um, <clears throat> how many of you have heard of the term MVP, right? What does it mean, sir? And what does that mean? Basic flow, yeah, but just, okay, right? And there's different kinds of things that you could build. Sometimes it's about just learning. You know, the MVP could be just about trying to get some in information, and oftentimes you would see people just putting these facades of, uh, of uh, organizations where behind there was no meat. Zappos, which is a big shoe, who's heard of Zappos? It's, it's a big shoe retailer in the US. The way they launched it, all they did was created a, one page, and behind, uh, there was really nothing. There was no real store, right? Um, it was essentially they, whenever they got orders, they actually would go to other stores and buy the shoes and ship them. Right? They were really testing an idea with in the cheapest way possible before they built out an entire inventory of systems. So, now that's a real party there, I think. So. <laughs> uh, and, and oftentimes, perhaps we're in this in space where we want to essentially learn a little bit more. Our MVP could be about. Prototypes, building prototypes cheaply. And we look at some examples of how we, we might do that. So the idea really is early releases have to focus on still validating your idea in the cheapest way possible before you build some big cathedral. Okay, that's really the general idea of an MVP. And so if you, if you are in the space where you need some sort of uh, um, creating nice landing pages just to see how could uh, people sort of uh, reach out to your idea or not, that's a, that's a great tool, Unbounce. Uh, um, I actually need the slide to talk through the next one. How many of you use Story Maps? Yeah. All available. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not in that one, not in the slide. I'll, I'll upload the latest slide, yeah. yeah absolutely, I'll do that. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe uh, beyond just landing pages, maybe that's not your business case. Perhaps what you need to do is still define your MVP. And oftentimes we find using, how many of you use story maps to visualize your product backlog in a two-dimensional format? Yeah, it's a great little tool. I would strongly encourage you guys, whether you use the other tools or not, in order to visualize your one-dimensional uh, product backlog, uh, a, a story map is a great way to add a second dimension to your product backlog. It gives you a much needed clarity as to how stories relate to each other and so forth and helping you fill gaps. Um, and we could use story maps here to build out your MVP. Again, these are all visualization techniques and tools, very simple tools. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need an electronic version. Grab a whiteboard and you can do this. The idea of a story map is you have your backbone of the major themes, and you build out your stories under those epics, if you will, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the most important things, and then the nice to have at the bottom, right? And then you create your releases based on your essential things. 
and not the nice to haves. Again, simple idea. <coughs> so, so this essentially is, is showing you a lean kit, which is another tool that we use, um, where once we've discovered the, 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 the fact that we, we are not just going to just blindly build uh, features without expressly validating them, we essentially made sure that before we even get to the, uh, the, the to do doing done column, we have a host of things uh, from our backlog, the validation aspect, making sure we actually talk to people before any of these features actually make it to the, uh, to the doing column. We're very, very intentional about throttling the amount of things that we are feeding into the dev team. Um, again, it's a very simple idea, but if you want to be uh, make little changes, I would say just making sure that you add a single column like validate before you get in could pay uh, rich dividends. So, so this is part of our uh, discovery validation and for, to the right would be our uh, development. Okay. So <clears throat> now that you have uh, this risk driven product backlog, uh, now you actually get into the sprinting aspect. And I don't have to define sprints to you guys, but what I want to uh, mention here is what some of the organizations that we are working with are doing. So in exploratory uh, sprints, I talk about team intercepting users, team helping design experiments. So in fact, Marriott uh, does this, as I mentioned, quite well. What they do is the, the development team itself, the agile, agile team within the sprint actually takes some time to uh, craft lightweight prototypes using balsamic or easel or some of these tools before they make changes to their hotel reservation system, the things that you see online right now, they actually intercept users in the field. And they have a captive set of early adopters, if you will, and they show them the stuff before they actually make any change to the website. Okay, And they do that, every, every team does that. And the team is actually helps design those experiments. Right? It's not some, some usability expert doing it for them. It's the actual team. So Balsamic, you guys have heard of Balsamic? Again, a very popular tool. I think some, not all of them are open source. You know, once you start looking for some of these prototyping tools, maybe you'll find some open source. But this is a great one for creating these very uh, low fidelity type prototypes, paper screens and so forth. So this is what Marriott would use. They use paper prototypes or maybe draw things on paper and they would actually go out talk to users uh, and before they actually implement anything. <clears throat> uh, Easel is an example of another great tool which actually is a little more sophisticated. We can actually cl uh, create clickable prototypes. It feels like a real website, but it really is it's just all smoke and mirrors. There's nothing behind. Um, so another good tool. So, so those are, uh, the previous examples were about uh, creating prototypes so that you can take it to users they can touch and feel. Concierge prototyping is an, an, another interesting example. I wanted to bring this example uh, because this was done by Intuit, Intuit, the software company, Intuit Global Services, uh, a few years ago, right outside of Bangalore. I forget the name of the little village. What they did was um, they wanted to essentially uh, help farmers uh, get better price for their crops. Okay, so that was their mission. And how did they do it? It's essentially like building a little stock market for farmers, because otherwise they were sort of being gouged uh, by, by landowners with, with unfair prices. Um, they didn't go out and build some sophisticated system. They talked to the farming community right here. I think it was 100 kilometers from here, uh, from outside of Bangalore. And in the end, what the, the initial cut of the solution they built was actually having the, the farmers register their mobile numbers uh, with Intuit, and Intuit actually would just send them SMS matching uh, matching uh, potential customer to the farmer. It was that's an example of a concierge prototype where you're not really building a, a platform, but it's, it's as simple as registering and sending SMS messages. Right. So um, the, the the you can read up more about it. It's called Fussle is the name of the the initiative that Intuit launched. Um, so hugely popular, I think now there's, I don't know what the current state is, but now there are tens of thousands of farmers registered. Uh, so an example of how a little thing can make a big difference. So. All right, <clears throat> any questions thus far? Um, 
So we've talked about exploratory sprints, about teams intercepting, being very intentional about uh, uh, soliciting feedback before you build things. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's not necessary that you have to do it intra sprint. Sometimes you have discovery teams, discovery teams which are one sprint ahead doing the sort of uh, exploration and then whatever they find, they bring it back to the team. So there's, it's a staggered sprint, if you will. Right? There's a discovery team that's one sprint ahead, then there's a delivery team that's one sprint behind. But the de delivery team is always um, making sure that they're spending their time on validated ideas. That's the, that's the gist of it. So at the end of the sprint, we talked about data-driven uh, solutions. What does that really mean? <clears throat> One of the things we talked about, and I mentioned, you want to stay away from vanity metrics. Just counting how many people came onto your website means nothing, right? So these guys back there, I see the guys who wrote Confengine, by the way, I didn't realize was a ex perfect example of a lean startup product. You know, the Confengine is, I had no idea that this sort of, it was Narasia's pet project, they sort of launched it, and now look at it. It's a, it's a full-blown platform, <laughs> right? Uh, <clears throat> Do you guys do lots of uh, metrics collection? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So, so these are called pirate met, uh, metrics again. Dave McClure, he has a great, uh, 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 on, I think it's on SlideShare, he has, and he has lots of talks on uh, meaningful metrics. Pirate metrics, they're called pirate metrics because pirates go arr. So this is all about acquisition, uh, activation, retention, uh, revenue, and referral. So in our case, for Sensei, what we were interested in were a couple of things, you know, how you know, people are, are uh, and we built a metrics dashboard, something that we hadn't done prior to the Lean Startup uh, conversations and so forth. The first thing we came back and we built ourselves a little dashboard that told us more than just what Google Analytics was telling us, which is number of people who signed in. So what we wanted to see is how many people, how many new organizations signed up, how many of them actually completed a retrospective. Look at this. 200 organizations and some big organizations, but look at the number of uh, uh, use cases that were actually completed. Just one. That's telling to us that, you know, this is not going to go far, right? So, again, um, Dave McClure, uh, definitely read his, uh, his articles and such on, on metrics and make them your own, but be sure that you are tracking something. Uh, a couple of other tools, Mixpanel and KISS metrics are again uh, good tools for this sort of uh, invasive uh, metrics. And finally, validating the product increment. So you built out a sliver of your features, if you will, or your stories, you, the MVP. And uh, how many of you do uh, A-B testing, multivariate testing? You heard of A-B testing? Yeah, do you wanna share what, what A-B testing is with us, anyone? Uh, it's not actually beta testing. A-B testing, multivariate testing, is you're essentially giving, as it says, you provide a certain interface, a version of an interface, and you channel some users to it, and another, uh, another set of users to, uh, to, to another version of the same thing. It's not quite beta testing, but you're really trying to see if I give two versions of a similar capability, which one resonates with people. These days, this, is, this kind of stuff is very, very common. Conference uh, engine guys, do you guys do that? Do you do A-B testing? Not yet, but they will soon enough. And what's interesting is when we, on our uh, silly little Sensei tool, and this was, you know, it was very interesting from a psychological perspective, we just changed where certain aspects of sign up were, and suddenly we start to see there were different uh, uh, higher registrations when things were top left versus bottom right. Colors made a huge difference. And tools such as Optimizely, again, very easy tool. There's other tools as well. You can very easily and dynamically change aspects of your pages um, and, 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 and redirect different customer segments uh, to different versions of, uh, you know. And for example, uh, we, see, we saw a huge uptick when we changed some of the wording. We said, this is a tool for conducting retrospectives for distributed teams. We just put the word distributed. We had a huge surge in the number of registrations. It's very fascinating to see how this sort of plays with uh, uh, you know, our human psyche, if you will. Um, 
So these days, even the, where we are, Marriott, things like that, obviously they do A-B testing for everything, but that's, that's a huge enterprise. Even in the federal space where I'm coaching right now, this is for immigration forms and so forth. Everything is A-B tested. You're giving different versions, uh, so this is not such a new thing anymore. Right, so. right. <clears throat> and uh, a few other tools that we tried, um, which is Qualaroo and Vufu. So uh, I use Qualaroo when we, we, we put that into our uh, Sensei tool. We, every time we introduce a product, we said, uh, let me see, I wanted to reach out to the, uh, to, to, to the registrant and say, did you like this feature that was added and so forth. Um, it, it didn't pan out for us as I'd hoped to, but there, it lets you conduct surveys. Right? If you're launching something new, it lets you conduct surveys and solicit feedback. Um, <clears throat> very easy integration with JavaScript. So uh, this one helped us quite a bit, uh, which is uh, what we, Zopim and Olark are a couple of tools that let you, um, it, we, we plugged it in for customer service. We wanted to, you know, you know Lean Startup says, em embrace your early adopters. Don't let them go, right? Be nice to them. So we said, okay, we, we're gonna provide real-time help. and. Um, and um, we integrated this, and what was interesting is was, if, if, while we intended for it to be just a help tool, it helped us connect with our early adopters and the most passionate, avid users in a more intimate fashion that we could have, we could have never had. I know at some point we put uh, help text with a phone number, our phones never rang. But the minute we put something like this, it's, 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 it's a sign of where things are moving, right? People are more comfortable with these sorts of interactions versus saying, Call, hello, 1-800, Raj, what can I do for you? That, that doesn't really work. So but this, this was really useful for us, so. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so again, data-driven uh, metrics, embracing your customer, and there's a plethora of tools out there that let you do that rather seamlessly and easily, okay? Um, so we're almost reaching the end. Uh, how much time do we have, five minutes or so? Yeah, so let me wrap this up very quickly. I, I just wanted to again share some uh, templates. Uh, you know, if you use Kanban discovery and delivery boards, I'm sure you have Kanban uh, delivery boards. You can sort of rejigger it and make sure that your discovery aspects are also part and parcel uh, along with your delivery, if you so choose. Um, again, <clears throat> and it's pretty self-explanatory. And when I share the slides, you can sort of take it, make it your own. Uh, and one thing I wanted to slide it in there because it may not be necessarily something that came from the Lean Startup movement or whatnot, is the idea of story refinement and grooming. You, pro you guys probably do that, uh, right? How many of you do the Three Amigos sessions and uh, uh, all of that? Anybody do that for your, pro yeah, there's a hand up. So you want to explain very quickly what the Three Amigos session is about? Yeah, you lifted your hand. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, right. it's really about engaging your developers, testers, and BAs in refining your stories with acceptance criteria and sort of furthering that into testable examples. And the reason I bring that in is, is about collaboration and communication. You're trying to bridge the gap across the disparate roles within your product teams. Um, and these days, there are tools such as Cucumber with a give and then format and so forth that is supposed to be a collaboration tool. Um, but recently, Matt Wynn, uh, um, the guy who created Cucumber, for those of you who are familiar with the tool Cucumber, uh, it's, uh, he said, you know, he's ha he was having a hard time, you know, trying to express acceptance criteria uh, and acceptance scenarios by using terms such as given, then, and some of the more technical terms. So example mapping is a very simple idea. All you do is for your stories, as you're, as you're refining them, you basically say, try to come up with the rules that sort of surround your story. I'm creating a login, let's say I want to create a, a login, login form. So the rule for that would be, what's the min and max length? Do you want your passport to expire after 30 days? These are all explicit rules that sort of surround your story. And further, examples are examples that illustrate that particular rule. So the, the reason I mention this is there's nothing rocket sciencey about this, but it's a very simple, way to make sure you have less technical people engaged in the conversations as you're, as you're refining your stories with acceptance criteria. 
These rules become your acceptance criteria. The examples become your acceptance scenarios for those stories. Right. So, again, it's out there. Very, very simple. We are using this a lot uh, when, when we talk to uh, our field agents and so forth who have no idea about the, uh, the technical aspects, but they're important for us from a, a business perspective. So. All right, this is just showing an example of how we do this. So this brings up to the end. I just wanted to just say of lean startup ideas are not just meant for the startup companies. A lot of these ideas that I had mentioned, and I'll give you examples of them, are permeating the enterprise as well, right? Um, and where I am, for, I, would, I would encourage you guys to check this out. I know it's not particularly directly relevant to you, but um, it's called the US Digital Services Playbook. It's a set of 13 uh, principles that guide all digital asset delivery in the, in the United States, uh, in, in the federal space. And if you look at it, there's at least four or five of them that you can directly see as inspired by the lean startup. Data-driven decisions. Understand what people need before you start building stuff. Uh, address the whole experience, not just about uh, the delivery aspect. The restructuring, the budgeting structures, and so forth to, to increase the kind of experimentation mindset that lean, uh, lean startup sort of uh, support. So it's, it's worth just taking a look, look, look at it. Uh, it's a quick read. Um, and this is a yeah, I want to close this out with one last thing. I mean, oftentimes, especially in the private sector, there's brand concerns. I can't be doing this experimenting, putting things out, fake ads, fake, you know, uh, concierge prototypes and so forth because I have a brand to protect. Well, oftentimes, people sort of spin off their own little things. Google Labs is an example. And recently, last month, I was at Capital One, um, it's a huge bank uh, in, the, in, in the US. They have Capital One Labs where Essentially, they're spinning off branches because they don't want to harm the, the parent brand to do a lot of these experimentation. But this is something that's sort of permeating the larger, larger enterprise for sure. So, um, so that's it. Any questions? I know I'm almost out of time. I'll be around if you have more questions about specific tools. Um, hope you've gotten something useful out of this session. And at the end, I have some list of books and a whole bunch of other tools. I'll share all of this in slides if it's, uh, it's, of, if, if it's of interest to you. Okay, any questions? One, I think we have a minute or so. But. No? Who's gonna go and do some discovery? No? No discovery? Yeah? <laughs> what are you gonna do? Intercept through users? Yeah, try that. You don't be afraid to try it, it pays off Big, yeah. The books, in fact, uh, Jez, Jez is here. I'm reading his uh, latest book. This is fascinating. It's really, really good. Talks a lot about uh, discovery and metrics and so forth. It's called Lean Enterprise, and I think he may be carrying, carrying it around. So I wonder if you attended Jez Humble's uh, session. Really, really good book. Highly recommended. All right. Anything else? We call it a wrap. Well, thank you for being here and uh, spending your afternoon. Yeah, yeah, thanks.